My aim today is to guide you in finding free RV camping in some of the most scenic and convenient locations on America's public lands. Let me start by asking you if you recognize this campground. Probably not. Yet some of you have very likely camped here, but they all start looking the same, don't they? In fact, this photo was taken at Trailer Village, the main RV campground at Grand Canyon National Park. But did you know that they've raised the rates there to $45 a night, oh, sorry, $44 a night recently? But I bet you didn't know that just one mile away, south of the main entrance park of the park, you could have camped for free in the Kaibab National Forest. Camping on public land like this is legal and totally free. And in the US, there are 2.3 billion acres of land. Just over 60% of that is public land, owned and administered by either the federal, state, or other local governments. And that's a lot of land that's been set aside for you, the public. I emphasize the word your for two reasons. You see, America's public land belongs to the public, right? That's all of us, right? Actually, as some of you may be aware, I'm Canadian. Perhaps some of you listening in are too. But the public land I'm going to be talking about today is all on American soil. So I need to start with a big thank you. Thank you to all the Americans in the audience for allowing foreigners like myself equal access to your land for our recreational use. So maybe you're wondering what makes me a Canadian an expert on camping on your public lands. To help answer that, I'll start by showing you a few photos. All of these were taken where we were camping for free somewhere on public land in the United States over the last 17 years. Perhaps some of you recognize some of those photos. In all these locations and hundreds upon hundreds more, camping for 14 days at a time is legal and totally free. To date, we've spent roughly 1,200 nights camped for 14 days at a time on your public land. Sometimes we just actually spend one or two nights at a time, but we could stay that long. If you add it up, that's more than three years worth of camping nights. Here we are, my husband Randy and myself, a few years younger in this picture, but uh, we've been RVing for 18 years, not full time. We have a permanent home uh, in a small village not far from Toronto, Ontario but we travel south in our RV for five or six months at a time every other year. But we return time and time again to our favorite destinations, which are in the American Southwest. And we say that's where the planet takes off its clothes and exposes itself. That's why we love it so much. With far less vegetation and trees, the display of geological beauty is second to none on this continent. We love the solitude and the freedom, but also the abundance of RV accessible public land. Beautiful landscapes, great hiking, and free scenic camping in places like this and this. We don't really have lots of money or huge income, yet we travel five or six months at a time and free camping mostly on your land is the key. If we'd paid for camping on those 1,200 nights, even at a low rate of $10 a night, we would be out of pocket by $12,000 more than we are right now. Of course, we do stay in some paid campgrounds, so our actual cost is not zero, um, but it has been just over $1,000. Our nightly average camping costs on those extended trips is somewhere between $1 and $2 per night. Now, not all public land camping is this scenic. We choose some locations for the view, others for convenience. If we need to drive miles out of our way to get to these sites, 
that would involve a huge additional fuel cost, so it wouldn't be really free camping, would it? But remember this campsite? It's the one that's only minutes from the rim of the Grand Canyon. And there are many similar examples. This free campsite is less than one mile from Capitol Reef National Park. In fact, park staff at Capitol Reef direct campers to that very location on public land whenever the park campground is full. And this peaceful free forest campground is less than one mile from the south entrance to Yosemite National Park, where if any of you have tried, you're probably aware that getting a campsite there, a campsite reservation even, at any time of year, is, is pretty well comparable to winning a lottery. Sometimes a free campsite is both convenient and scenic in itself. You might recognize these rock spires. This is a free camping location about seven miles away from Bryce Canyon National Park. This kind of camping is definitely called boondocking. You won't have hookups and you can't expect any facilities at all, but RVs are built to handle that. Even without a generator or modifications like solar, most RVs are equipped for dry camping for at least a couple of nights at a time. Longer if you take the care to conserve your power, your water, propane, and not fill up your waste tank. Of course, you'll notice that our 19-foot rig is somewhat small compared to most RVs. So I'm sure you have two questions. How can I find these scenic free public land campsites? And can I access them with my rig if it's 25, 30, or 40 feet long? At a great majority of the sites that we go to, and most of those that I just showed you in those photos, the answer is yes, absolutely. I'll talk about more of that in a bit. But first, let's define public land in America how to find it, and what the rules are. Various government entities, including federal, state, county, and other municipal governments manage the lands referred to as public lands, or sometimes they're called the public domain. So for this webinar, I, I can only concentrate on one aspect, federal lands, but that's sort of the one that most RVers are drawn to. It's controlled by various agencies as depicted by the different colors on this map. Not all of it is in the West, but it sure looks like it's concentrated there, and it is. Actually, I like this visual depiction. The red areas here show the percentage of federal land ownership in each state. I'm also going to concentrate on just two federal land agencies the uh, ones that are most useful to RVers who are looking for free camping. These are the National Forest Service and the Bureau of Land Management. By the way, government agencies call this type of camping dispersed camping, not boondocking or dry camping. Those terms generally are only known to RVers. Although dispersed camping may be free, it's not a free for all. There are rules. Most are similar across various federal land agencies. And to keep it simple, uh, each district may have slightly various uh, variations, but to keep it simple, here are the basics. In general, you may camp in one location for up to 14 days in the 28 day period. After 14 days, you must move a minimum distance of 25 miles away and a minimum distance away from pay campgrounds and water sources. May be about 100 feet from main roads and water sources. Um, and driving off road is also restricted. Again, that might vary from one area to the next. Other than that, you can camp anywhere. So, uh, Camping anywhere, however, they do ask that you stick to previously used sites wherever possible. 
and of course, follow the no trace, leave no trace etiquette. The US Forest Service manages 155 national forests and 20 grasslands in uh, the United States and encompasses 193 million acres. Uh, this map actually shows where they all are. National forests have many campgrounds, which are usually quite a bit cheaper than commercial campgrounds, but they really have hookups. So if you're going to be dry camping anyway, why not do it for free? Free dispersed camping is permitted anywhere within the rules I just described, that is. Um, and there are many dirt roads, and with a bit of effort, previously used campground campsites um, outside of the actual campgrounds are not very difficult to find. But first I'll move on to Bureau of Land Management. That's our other most favorite RV boondocking on public lands. They manage 264 million acres of land. Their campgrounds are usually even less expensive than those in the national forests. But again, dispersed camping is an option with similar rules to the forest. Most BLM land is in the west, and it's more likely to be desert terrain. Without as many trees in the way, there are usually more dirt roads, and it's easier to spot camping opportunities. You might have heard of some snowbirds who spend their entire winter boondocking in the Arizona and California deserts. They're on BLM managed land. So how come they can stay longer than 14 days? Well, they're usually parked in a long-term visitor area, or sometimes just called an LTVA. And that's where camping is not quite free, but almost. A $180 Annual permit is good for the whole season, September 15th through April 15th. That's 84 cents per night. Or they can pay $40 for 14 consecutive days at a time. That permit lets them move between seven LTVA locations in Southern Arizona and California. But for short terms, you don't even need a permit at all because bordering most of those areas is more BLM land where the normal dispersed camping rules apply. You can camp for free for up to 14 days on those bordering lands. But what happens in summer? Well, you don't need a permit at all in those locations, but it's gonna to be too hot to be there. In summer, there's a second option, higher elevation LTVAs. It's a series of camping areas along scenic Highway 395 in California. A separate permit for these is available on a first come first served basis from the BLM office in Bishop, California. Unlike the Southern LTVA permit, you have to be quick to get one of these though. They're more expensive, but the demand usually exceeds supply. The BLM also manages a series of special areas such as um, these. And uh, you need to be aware that often the rules will be different in these specially designated areas. One example and a personal favorite of ours is, Ex is Escalante National Monument in Utah, shown here. Free camping is permitted all over the monument, but you have to register for a permit. It's still free, but you have to register at one of the uh, area BLM offices. There are four other federal land agencies. Um, these are the two that you might recognize, the National Park Service, of course, and the Corps of Engineers. They have some great pay campgrounds, but dispersed camping is generally not an option on those lands. But let's get to what presumably you came here to learn. How do you figure out where all these great free scenic campsites are? Well, one old fashioned tool that we still use is a good old map book. Benchmark and Gazetteer are the two most detailed road atlases that would show color coded public lands. You can find them on Amazon or in stores, especially in the states in the areas that they cover. So 
Of course, the map scale is such that often similar tracts of public land, uh, or the smaller tracts rather, um, don't show up on, on the map. So, but as I say, there's an app for that. The US Public Lands app is a really cool tool that we use. Um, it shows all federal lands that have an area of at least 600 acres in size. But because nature didn't draw the boundaries around the parks, the scenery often extends way beyond the park boundaries. And frequently that land is controlled by two agencies, the ones I just mentioned, the National Forest or the Bureau of Land Management. So if you can find some dirt roads into those areas, you're likely to find free dispersed camping, often that many people have used in the past. We never drive by a ranger station or a visitor uh, center for any of these land agencies without stopping in. We talk to the staff. We ask them their personal favorite dispersed campsites. They love telling you where they are. We point out the size and clearance of our RV so that they don't send us down a road that we won't be able to go down. Also ask for the free vehicle use map. Most national forests now have them. Uh, there's a separate map for each district in that forest. The roads marked on this map are the only ones that vehicles are actually permitted to drive on. Uh, other roads may not be marked as close to traffic actually physically when you come to them, but you could get into trouble for driving them. So you should always have one of these maps to let you know where you're allowed to travel and consequently camp. By reading the legend on the map, often you'll find that some of the dispersed camping um, rules are listed there and sometimes even their preferred or known dispersed camping areas are shown. We find that that's true of some of the maps. Um, one particular that does show it is, is uh, the Kaibab near uh, the Grand Canyon. We use Google Maps a lot too. The Earth or Satellite View uh, lets you zoom in to look for obvious signs of disturbance. When you already know that you've, uh, you're on an area that's public land, you can then see these areas of disturbance. And like in this picture, you can say, hey, this is just off the highway, and that is an RV parked in that picture. If they can get there, I probably can there, get there too. We, uh, you can mark spots of interest to you uh, with a pin on Google Earth. This is what we do. Now, unfortunately, the image is not always clear enough on Google Earth to determine the condition of the access roads. Um, they may require high clearance, four by four vehicle. And so that, and there also might be a, a private property signage somewhere that doesn't show um, on, on your Google satellite view. And unfortunately, Google Street View could help with that, but so far they have chosen not to take that camera down America's dirt roads just yet. So sometimes uh, this is the type of road that you'll encounter. Um, it'll lie between you and that coveted free campsite that you saw. Now, our road trek, it has rather low clearance. It's not four by four, but it's short enough that, and we're brave, or maybe just not, uh, we're just brave and just bold enough to uh, venture down narrow dirt roads that maybe our veers should and would wisely not attempt. The worst case scenario when we're in this or you are driving it in your tow vehicle is that you uh, come to a spot in the road that you dare not cross and turn around. So if the road's too narrow, we can just back up to a spot where we can turn around and do a 15 point turn if we have to. But unless you're in a similar rig to us, you may not want to attempt that. So how do you know what roads are okay? Well, there are a few clues. First of all, there's no sense going down roads that don't lead to results in the end. So look for road signage um, through public land. A lot of it will display the agency logo on it. Or often, if you just see a simple brown sign, with simple lettering, that indicates right there that it's a federal land agency. 
that uh, that road belongs to. The shapes of the route markers is also an indication. It can help you determine road conditions. The top one shown here, the uh, top distinctive shape there, it indicates highly traveled roads. So it's pretty safe to drive down those in any vehicle. The horizontal uh, road numbers sign indicates minor collector roads. You might attempt to drive them in a car, but not pulling a trailer for sure, until you at least venture in the car first. But vertical markers are roads to avoid. Those are the lesser roads, usually only suitable for four by four vehicles. Now for the past six years that we've been RVing in the Southwest, we've spent hours before each trip pouring over maps and all kinds of resources, including the days and directory of course, and many, many other free camping websites that there are on the internet these days. Uh, most of them are crowdsourced. That just means that all kinds of different people who've been to these spots have adjusted the information and contributed information. We've also followed leads uh, from the major RV forums and some bloggers that we follow who list their favorite spots. But early on in our travels, I also started keeping my own record of the sites that we camped on and uh, concentrating on those that we definitely wanted to return to ourselves. The most scenic or most convenient to the routes that we drive between the major parks and other points of interest. Recognizing how much work it took to research, th research those sites and that there wasn't one guide for finding them in 2007, as a hobby, I started a new website called frugalrvtravel.com. Before I knew it, I'd also written six guidebooks for boondocking in various parts of the Southwest. And I'd given my name and myself a name that no one could remember, a shunpiker. It's a word I fell in love with, and it simply means someone who shuns the turnpikes and toll roads in favor of driving the more scenic back roads. That's us. You might be surprised to learn that more than 80% of the boondocking spots in the guides are accessible to rigs up to 40 feet or even longer. Actually, now I think my time is up, um, but there's a ton of information I wasn't able to cover but if you're ready, Georgianne, um, we can maybe turn back to the camera and I'll be happy to answer any questions. We've got several questions lined up already for you. Um, one of the first ones, especially since we were just talking about you being Canadian, someone has asked, Chris has asked if you have any resources for Canadians like yourself for public land options. You mean in Canada itself? I think uh, so. Yes, we, we, we uh, have, uh, I don't have any personal resources that I've written, um, but I would certainly direct you again to um, the same resources that we use to find public land um, camping locations in the States, which would be um, Days and Directory, always a good source. Uh, the um, Google, searching on Google maps when you know you're on crown land. In, in Canada, we have crown lands. Uh, unfortunately, um, and one of the reasons that we keep returning to the states and to the southwest is just like in the uh, more populated eastern states, uh, the crown land is not really there in our populated areas. It's in the north. And because most of the north country here is so forested, there um, it's, it's really a little more difficult to, to locate places uh, on Crown land. Uh, there's fewer roads going into it. Um, and really when the scenery is blocked by the trees and the vegetation, it's not nearly as appealing. So um, I know that out West, BC, Alberta, I'm not personally familiar with traveling through those um, provinces, but I know that there's more of it out there than here. And again, I think the Days End directory is probably one of your better choices for locating spots. 
Awesome. Thank you for that information. And for those of you who may not already be Escapees members, when she says Days End Directory, she's referring to a directory that was created by one of our members for our members that is chock full of all kinds of opportunities for um, for free or very inexpensive parking with fellow Escapees members. A lot of them open up some of their private land um, to share that information with each other. There's also uh, listings in there for other public land opportunities. So there's lots of information in that, in that directory. Um, so uh, Gerald asked Marianne about concerns about the safety, for example, if other campers are nearby, probably some personal safety with regards to wildlife or maybe even I've heard, I've seen it mentioned in some other situations where people are concerned about um, just general people, like people that have ill intentions wandering into your campsite because they know you're in the middle of nowhere, that sort of thing. Do you have any suggestions about that? Well, it is one of the questions we get. Uh, the, I would say just try it, try it. Start boondocking somewhere where um, you have got other people around and then um, other RVers because the more, if you've done it once or twice, you will become comfortable with it. We personally are more comfortable boondocking in the middle of nowhere um, than we are um, in a Walmart parking lot. <laughs> because there's less likelihood that someone is um, nefarious going to be walking around, um, going to try and break into your RV, if, if that's the concern, um, and less um, chance, or in a Walmart parking lot, less chance that uh, somebody, a, a neighboring um, RVer might actually care. <laughs> Uh, when boondocking in a place, if you start off not in a place that's unknown, but in a place that other people have also found and you have a few other boondocking neighbors, um, go and meet them. Get a feel for them. You have wheels. You can pull out if they don't feel safe. And you can then kind of keep an eye on each other's activities. Um, make friends with your neighbors, just like you would in a campground. That's well, my advice. Is, I'm sorry to interrupt you. Something I've seen other um, boondockers or frequent boondockers talk about on their blogs and whatnot, is there are lots of social groups out there for boondockers. And so if you're more comfortable, connect with a couple of social groups and see if you've got three or four new friends that might be interested in joining you somewhere and make your own little mini, very beautiful and comfortable RV park in the middle of wherever you'd like to go. And that way you guys can help watch each other's backs if necessary. If maybe you have to run errands into town, someone can stay and help watch the stuff that's at your site that sort of thing. And so if you're very concerned about personal safety in that regards, maybe it's a good idea to start off with a small group of people first. Um, so Shannon has asked Marianne, how do you find ranger stations and BLM headquarters? For example, is there a federal website to look them up on or do you have to go to each individual agency's website? Um, actually, there is um, a National Forest website that you can look up the different agency um, ad uh, addresses where their visitor stations are. Um, there, um, uh, and also with the Bureau of Land Management, uh, uh, there are definitely websites where you can look up the exact addresses. You also, uh, in the resources um, that I've shared with you, George Ann, that you can share with the members, there's a, there is a resources little handout that I have. Um, uh, the address, the web addresses will be listed there, but um, each, especially with the National Forest, uh, each uh, ranger district, so each National Forest itself is generally divided into several ranger districts, and each district will have a visitor center slash office um, ranger station somewhere within that area. So when you're passing through, uh, they're even marked on the public lands or, or on uh, like the map books. They're, they're ma the, often the, the visitor stations are marked on a map book uh, as well if you're following a, a traditional map book like we do. So there's many ways to find their offices. Fantastic. And I know you've mentioned this a little bit, um, but it's it's partially protocol and courtesy to stop in at the ranger stations whenever you found your way to your perfect um, public land spot. And I know having personally done a little bit of boondocking on my own earlier this year in Western Arizona, which was beautiful, it was also raining a lot. And so sometimes checking in with those different rangers is a huge help. So that in case an emergency comes up, they know that you're there and to go find you and make sure you're safe. 
And so once you do find those stations, just give them a little courtesy pop in like, hey, I'm here, I'm going to be in this vicinity for this long. Um, in most cases, they're very friendly, they're happy to know that you're there, they want to help you. Um, and like you've said earlier, they also are very happy to share their favorite places to recommend for you to go and, and get your, your little peak of heaven kind of thing. So. And very, sorry to interrupt. Yeah. Very important too um, is that they will know the current road conditions. I mean, I've written all these guides based on what I saw when I was there, but things change, you know, floods happen, um, roads are better or worse one year from another so current uh, conditions is is what you need to know do you find marianne that things like um like when you use google maps for example and you turn on the terrain like the satellite option where you can see what the terrain actually looks like do you find that useful when you are trying to navigate to a spot we find it useful for finding spots and sort of pinning spots of interest but then actually driving the road it's really the the satellite view is not good enough to know the road conditions that's uh, that would take them sending that um uh, what's that street mobile that they drive the, so you can have the actual you know view from the road uh, if, if once they send start sending those down dirt roads that would be great <laughs> But then everyone's going to know your favorite spots, and so then it's a problem. <laughs> um, so far, it hasn't been. Well, do you have, so you recommended the Public Lands app. Um, do you have any other apps or tools like that, aside, like, as far as digital tools that you could use that you would suggest, even maybe weather trackers for when you're in an area and trying to keep an eye on the weather yourself as well, that sort of thing? Um, uh, we really do just use whatever the tool that is installed on my phone. I don't even know what it's called uh, for weather. There are so many weather tools. Um, I don't particularly have a favorite, so I'm sorry. I, no, that's I, perfectly I don't have, fine. There, there are lots of things out there for different people, and there's just people simply have different preferences. Yeah. Um, so if you guys have any other questions, that's all that we've got so far. If you have any other questions, make sure you ask. We've, otherwise, um, I will let you guys get back to your afternoons. Oh, Kelly says, um, so the other webinar videos, that's a great question, Kelly. We actually have a web, a, a page on our website on escapees.com. It's under the education section and it's towards the bottom of that menu. It says webinars. Um, you, if you go to that page, you'll see all of our upcoming webinars as well as the links to register for those. And then towards the bottom of that page, you'll see links to all of our past webinars. And most of those links lead to our YouTube channel. So if you want to bypass all of that and just go straight to Escapees RV Club's YouTube channel, you'll see all of our webinars there as well. It looks like Larry has suggested um, MyRadar as an, as an app for weather watching. Um, and it looks like, oh, well, so you have a fel another fellow Canadian. Uh, and it looks like he's also a member of Boondockers Welcome. So perfect. <laughs> All right. Well, thank, thank you again, everybody, for sticking with us. And hopefully we will see you all down the road. Have a great day.